We've completed the book of Job, and I want to deal with a psalm or two before we finish our studies in the poetic and wisdom literature. Psalm 103, I've entitled it, Bless the Lord. If you wonder why, why, it's because you haven't read it, have you? Verse 1, he says, bless the Lord. Verse 2, bless the Lord. Verse 20, bless the Lord. Verse 21, bless the Lord. Verse 22, bless the Lord. So it wasn't hard to get a theme or title for Psalm 103, bless the Lord. I spent a lot of time in this psalm, and so what I bring forth is not only from years of study, but out of my own heart and experience. And I trust that many of you will be able to identify with a lot of the things that are here. Well, let's come to the exposition of it. Now, we're treating this as a part of our studies in poetic and wisdom literature, because certainly that would fall in that category. I've divided it into two parts, really. So the first division of the psalm is the cause for praise. The cause for praise. That's verses 1 to 5. One under this is that we should exhort ourselves to bless the Lord as the psalmist does for his benefits. We should exhort ourselves to bless the Lord for his benefits as the psalmist himself does. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. You ought to be able to recite or say the first five verses by heart. <laughs> bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, praise the Lord. I recite that every morning without exception. Not just reciting it, but I claim the first five verses. Actually, the verses three, four, and five is what I claim, but you're blessing the Lord when you believe his benefits and just appropriate them by faith daily. You know, there's some things you don't appropriate once for all in the sense that you just say, well, I claim healing. Like as if, you know, you can walk through life because you said, I claim it. There's such things as battles and trials and so forth. All right. Now, he says that his soul blesses the Lord. Now, we know from our study of the Bible, especially Old Testament theology, as well as biblical theology, that the soul is the person, the self, you. That is the personality, not just a lip service, you see. And he says, all that's within me. Again, we have discovered from our study that things like the heart and the liver and the mind and the stomach and the organs of the body are regarded, were regarded by the Hebrews as the seat of such things as the will and the emotions and the appetites. And so that's what he's saying here. Now see, he's a Hebrew. This is David. And Hebrews would understand him without all this explanation. What he's actually saying here is, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all my being, with all my being, I bless the Lord. Not just lip service, but with every organ of my body, the mind, body, soul, spirit, and everything in the body, blesses the Lord. It's out of the depths of his whole being. Now the phrase here, bless the Lord, is the keynote to the psalm. As we've already said, it occurs several times. Now, I know many of you have sung this and recited it, but blessing the Lord is not like praising the Lord. To bless is more than praise. To bless the Lord is more than praise. To bless the Lord is to praise Him with all your affection, with all your gratitude out of the depths of your being. 
you're blessing him. What is it when God blesses you? He doesn't say, bless you. He doesn't pay lip service. He blesses you. He does something for you in your behalf because he loves you. The Lord blesses us. We're always talking about his blessings. We're told to bless our enemies and do good to them. Not just say, bless you. He'll say, curse you. But if you do good to him, it isn't likely he will say, curse you. So blessing God is not just praising the Lord. It's praise that comes out of the depths of our being and ministers to God. We can't give him anything. We can't give him a new car or a healing or save one of his loved ones like he can bless us with things. What can we give him? Nothing but what we see in Acts 13 are praise and our worship. We can minister to him. That's when you pray in tongues. Many times you're ministering to the Lord. We always have a book on everything we say. Why speak in tongues? The subtitle, The Christian's Threefold Ministry Through Prayer and the Spirit. You minister to yourself. Jude 20, you build yourself up in the faith through prayer and the Holy Spirit. You minister to others, make intercession for them. Ephesians 6, 18, intercede for others always in the Spirit. And then you minister to God. You speak mysteries to Him, 1 Corinthians 14. You bless the Lord. Of course, you can do that with your educated intellect, but it's not nearly as effective. And I don't think God likes it as much as that which He Himself inspires by the Spirit, but we won't quarrel with anyone over that. What we're saying, though, is significant that we give God something. We're not just saying, praise the Lord, but... Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, for what he's done for me. You ever sit and bless the Lord? I do. Oh, I thank him. I don't just say praise the Lord and get up and go about my business, but I praise your holy name. I thank you for what you've done, for your grace, for your mercy, for your redemption, for your salvation, healing, protection, deliverance, financial prosperity, for that car there, for this chair I'm sitting in. We bless the Lord that way, with your soul, with your being. Well, now when you pray or when you recite this to the Lord, don't skip over, bless the Lord too quickly. You know, don't just say it, do it. Now, I recognize it's possible to praise the Lord and not bless him, but this isn't what we're getting at here. God wants us to praise him in such a way that he's blessed. You can take a song like, praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. We used to sing that all the time. And I don't know if you're ever back in an institutional church where they sing that. Look at their faces. <laughs> and see if you really think they're singing anything out of the depths of their soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. It's just words. Oh, occasionally there will be a person who really means it. He's had a blessing, been healed through surgery or something, and still is grateful to God. I used to thank God that I didn't die on the operating table, you know, so I was sincere. And I don't know how God looks upon all that, but it's possible to praise the Lord and not bless him. I don't think you can really bless him until you enter into these benefits because that's what we're blessing him for. What would you bless him about? Except you're blessing him by acknowledging all the things this psalm talks about. Blessing him for his righteousness, his sovereignty, his judgment against your enemies, deliverance and healing, restoring your youth, everything. Then we are to bless, he said, his holy name. Now the covenant name of God is used 11 times in this psalm. I mean 11 times in 22 verses is quite a bit. It's the covenant name Yahweh, as we know. Y-A-H-V-E-H, -E Yahweh. That was his Old Testament covenant name. And we're told here to bless his holy name. You see, God doesn't inspire words that are meaningless. He didn't say, 
Just bless God. Say, bless God. You hear people say, well, bless God. I didn't die from that ailment. Or bless God. He helped me overcome. But he says to bless his name. In the Old Testament, that would be Yahweh. To us, it would be Jesus. I mean, anyone can say, bless God, bless the Lord, but say, bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Bless his holy name. And he uses it 11 times to tell you his name. And of course, we know from the New Testament that the Jesus of the New is the Yahweh of the Old. Now, I hear Christians many, many times blessing the doctors in medical science and psychiatrists that help them, or at least they say they did. And the men that have some way blessed them or helped them, you hear them blessing man. And I'm sincere when I say I have, in 25 years, very seldom heard a Christian bless the Lord, or even say, praise the Lord. Yeah. It still shocks Christians to hear you say that. Even some charismatics, although it's not unusual to hear a charismatic say, praise the Lord. You even hear that on the radio when they're calling up somebody on a talk show or something. Occasionally. And some will bless and praise good luck. Oh, I was lucky. Other Christians will tell you how lucky you are. And of course, a person who knows the source of his so-called good luck says the way you spell good luck is J-E-S-U-S. -E it's Jesus. No, it wasn't luck. So bless his holy name. Now you've got to get in the name realm. It's all right to say praise the Lord and praise God. Sometimes to do that, but if it's meaningful to God, get God's name in there as often as you can. The only name he's revealed to us is the name of his son, Jesus Christ, because the Father is simply called the Father. It's all right to say, bless the Father, but people don't know who you're talking about, so I can guarantee you one thing if you say, bless Jesus, thank Jesus. They don't know who you're talking about right away. You better believe it. They'll have you located as loco immediately. It's interesting how the conversation immediately changes when you get Jesus Christ in it, most of the time. Even with professing Christians. Well, bless his holy name. O my soul, forget not all of his benefits, as the human heart is prone to do. He could have well added. Deuteronomy 6.12, Moses said, Beware lest you forget the Lord. And they did. It's human nature. So often I've heard Christians complain if they have a physical trial, financial problem, if the goings are a little rough for them for a while, I hear them complaining. And I know those same Christians have received many benefits from the Lord, and they've forgotten those, apparently. When you complain to the Lord about some financial thing, or physical, or domestic problem, you're really forgetting all of the domestic blessing he's given you. It could be much worse than you think it is at present. And it hasn't been that bad from your wedding day on. So start thanking him for all those good times, those benefits and financial. You may be going through a financial trial. Well, instead of getting, as one brother did, a little angry with the Lord, he told me, because it didn't work for him like it did for Hobart, and wanted to know why. Well, I said, we could start with, I never asked God why, when the money didn't come to the 30th. But he got over that because he had really forgotten all the benefits financially God had given him. Forget not all of his benefits. Some people forget as soon as they get them. That's the one that really hurts. It hurts me, and I know it hurts God. Things you do for people in the name of Jesus many times are not appreciated by other Christians. They just take it for, well, he's the pastor, he should do that, or he's a member of the same body I am, and I've got a need, and that's as far as it goes. $500 you find on your car seat, well, praise the Lord. And some don't even come in and testify to it. That's what I'm saying. And greater things than that, $500 is nothing. But I remember 
I could give some personal examples, but it would sound like I'm complaining. Like, you know, well, they didn't appreciate what we did for them, and they didn't. <laughs> but rather than get into personal things, I mean, I've had people where you help them turn on you and criticize you and hurt the work, the ministry. But, for example, once I was in Texas, 1966, right after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I was in a three-week seminar. Two weeks at Gordon Lindsay's and one week over at W.V. Grant's. And as I was in the prayer room, one afternoon, I think after lunch, Brother and I went in there, and they didn't have over a 10-watt bulb, maybe a 5-watt. You couldn't see anything. You had to wait after you came in out of the Texas sun before you could actually start walking. But there were a number of people in there praying. And as I was kneeling there praying with this other brother, Someone came in, I later discovered it was one of the ministers ministering in that seminar that week. And he walked over in the darkness to a woman, put his hand on her shoulder and said, the Lord has just shown me in a vision that you've got terminal cancer and he wants you to know you're healed right now. Well, they had a shouting meeting in there. It was word of knowledge and he just walked into a place where, as I say, you'd have to wait a few minutes to see if anybody was in there. He walked right to her. And he had been upstairs. It was church auditorium. So that night when W.V. Grant got up to introduce whoever spoke that night, he said, the Lord performed a wonderful miracle today. Of course, miracles were taking place all the time, healings and things, and explained how it happened that someone, one of the ministers that had a word of knowledge, went into the prayer room and told this woman that she was dying of cancer. That's right. He said, well, you're healed. And she was instantly healed. And he said, would she stand up and just let us see her? Give the Lord the praise and glory for it. And he was doing like I'm doing, waiting, waiting. Well, he said, that's the way it is. They often won't even come back the same day to praise the Lord. You see, it was a week seminar with services three times a day. She got what she needed. Well, you could say, how do you know she didn't have to babysit? Would you say that? Babysit. Well, anyway, yes, maybe she had a Girl Scout cookie sale or something. <laughs> something real important is what I'm saying, that she couldn't get back to praise the Lord. I was new in all of this, but I couldn't believe that a person who was dying supernaturally and instantly healed wouldn't be back there running up and down the aisles or something, or at least be waiting for a chance to praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Well, forget not all these benefits. I don't know why God heals people that forget. But before you criticize anyone, oh, oh we better look in the mirror, shouldn't we? Start making up a list of what you've forgotten he's done. And pull it out. Save it and pull it out sometimes when you think maybe God's forgotten you. You can pull that list out and see he hasn't forgotten you didn't in the past, he won't in the present or the future. Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that's been in me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all, forget not all his benefits. Well, the church today has forgotten some. What are his benefits? I've got about six listed here, verses three to five, and I've entitled them, Here Are His Benefits. And I'll deal with them one to one. Remission, restoration, then redemption, coronation, satisfaction, and rejuvenation. <laughs> that? That's about six benefits, five or six there. That, that's not all of them, but that's certainly some of the most significant, important ones. Some that we're all entering into by faith, if we believe it at least. Remission, restoration, redemption, coronation, satisfaction, rejuvenation. They're all there, three to five. Do you see them? He forgives all your iniquities, redemption. He heals all your diseases. He restores your health, you see, restoration. He redeems your life from destruction, redemption. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, coronation. 
He satisfies your mouth with good things. Satisfaction. And he renews or rejuvenates your youth like the eagles. Well, some of you younger people may not be too interested in that last one. <laughs> but you will be if the Lord tarries. <laughs> but I've got a little deeper insight than that. From the moment you're born, you begin to die. So if you're three or above, three, because maybe you can start understanding us about three, well, let's say from five on here tonight, you ought to start claiming it all. If you're five years old, you're five years old. You never say young. On the other side, it'll be I'm um, two and a half million years young when we get over there, but not this side. You're six months old. Why do you suppose that ever was given such expression? Adam never thought of that. That didn't come on the other side of the garden. Adam wasn't so many years old. Adam would have had perpetual physical life. Of course, no point in speculating. God would have probably just translated him, but we know that it didn't work out that way. But the point is, there's no reason for Adam to grow old. As the scientists have shown us, biology, there's no reason why we should die, really. Physically, that is. Of course, we know why. I don't think they'll accept the <laughs> cause that produces the effect of death, but we can tell them it's Romans 5.12, sin. Yeah. But anyway, here are all the benefits. Remission, verse 3a, he says, He forgives all your iniquities. Now this is the greatest of all the benefits, the one he begins with. I believe he placed it first because it comes first. See, without that benefit, you couldn't claim the others. The remission of your sins. That's placed first for that which you ought to bless Yahweh, bless the Lord, bless Jesus. That that does come first is also seen in the New Testament in Jesus' ministry. The account in Mark 2 is a good illustration of this. He said to the man sick of palsy, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Second, first of all, he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. We won't get into the pharisaical reaction to that, but for our purpose, he put first things first. The greatest and possible blessing was not the healing of his body, but of his soul, because if he would have healed his body, it would have been temporary. That is, the enjoyment of that benefit would have been temporary, only as long as he lived. Now, because first things are first everywhere in the Bible, is no cause for the institutional church doing what it's done and placed all the emphasis upon one of these benefits to the neglect of the others. I could say all of the others. But certainly the other one concerning healing in the same verse. But notice that Jesus healed the whole man. He healed the whole man in Mark chapter 2. He did not stop with soul sickness, but physical sickness. So remission comes first. The reason that I can't use redemption here in the theological sense for the first one, and remission is also a theological term, remission of sins, is because the text itself uses redemption concerning deliverance. So that we're not repeating ourselves in my outline, We'll take remission first and get to redemption, meaning deliverance, later. All right, secondly, then, is restoration. He heals all thy diseases, verse 3b. Now, God intended these two to go together because even in the Hebrew they're together. If you look at the Hebrew versification, they go right together. And anyway, the idea, the parallelism, and we studied that in poetical literature here, Parallelism puts them together. God intended them to go together because in the atonement in Isaiah 53, he puts them together. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. He bore your diseases and carried away your pains. 
He was bruised for your iniquities, and with his stripes you're healed. See, it's all together. It isn't separated in the passage on the crucifixion in Isaiah 53. God intended they should stay together. But man has separated them. But you won't find that in the Bible. You don't find it in the old or new. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am thy Savior, thy Redeemer, the Lord that healeth thee. In Mark 16, go preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons. You see, it's together in the commission. Now, institutional religion has robbed Christians of this benefit. It's really sad. And I don't say that in criticism because for years I just followed what I had been taught or what the commentary said at this point because I'd never been in a church that claimed all these benefits. They claimed the first one, all your iniquities and some of your diseases if it's God's will and then through medical science. I was reading a non-charismatic writer on Psalm 103. If you ask why, well, I don't recommend you do it unless you can pick the meat off the bones, but it was very difficult. And all I'm saying is I read it. I didn't get anything out of it. But <laughs> he suggests very strongly, he urges that we translate this verse as follows. He forgiveth all thine iniquities and he healeth all thy soul diseases. <laughs> soul diseases. He said it's one of those parallelisms where it's repetitive, you know, that God says the same thing twice. He forgives all your iniquities. He heals all of your iniquities. Well, and then in his treatment of it, he went on to quote the case of King Asa, who died, we're told, because in his affliction, in his sickness, he was diseased in the feet. He died because he sought to the physicians and not the Lord in his healing. And he said, now, what Second Chronicles means by that statement, that he died because he sought to the physicians and not the Lord in his sickness, is that King Asa's sin was not in going to the physicians for healing, but in not going to God first, so that God could have sent him to the physicians. <laughs> I couldn't believe. I read a lot of things that make you shake your head, but I couldn't believe it because he was acting like an authority in the Old Testament because he was writing on the Psalms. You shouldn't set yourself up as a teacher unless you can read Hebrew and know Old Testament theology, but apparently it's never occurred to this author that there were no physicians in Israel. Absolutely not one. So how? He said his sin is not in going to the physicians for his healing, seeking healing, but in not going to God first so that God would send him to the physician. Of course, I don't know how he would do that, where he'd shout down out of heaven or what, but that's the way he said it, exactly. There were no physicians in Israel. God said, I am your physician. I am the Lord that healeth thee. No remedies. God deals quite extensively in the law in the ceremonies with sickness and purifications and impurities and diseases. And without exception, it's always to be dealt with by the priest and the Lord. Amen. No, in all of the treatments, and he gives many treatments of that is how to deal with things, and it's always by faith and a purification right through the priest and looking to the Lord in faith for healing. Well, before we condemn him for his lack of understanding of the word, what really hurts is to see charismatics who limit, who limit this benefit, limit its effect. And I don't know which is worse. I suppose the second is worse. You don't expect a non-charismatic to understand about divine healing, because I didn't. I mean, certainly I sincerely searched the Word, and I went through enough sickness that if it was there for me to see without the Holy Spirit to enlighten my Baptist mind, I would have seen it because the last operation before I had it for two years, I waited before the Lord two years because I was like the woman with the issue of blood. I'd gone to all of them. They tried all of their pills and drugs. They practiced medicine literally on me. It was medical practice. 
They admitted that. We can't find what's wrong. We don't know why you hurt or why you bleed. But I did both. You know, finally, I got tired of their experimentation. And as a Baptist, I turned to James 5, where no Baptist ever gets. But <laughs> I had taught the church one time when I taught James. I said, why don't we believe this today? I didn't expect anybody to take it seriously. I wish they would, but I said, there it is, James 5. I'm going to take it for what it said. And I even quit taking the oath and everything that we're told in James. As far as I had light, I mean. That was way back when, you know, to say not take an oath to a Baptist, well, you'd really be misunderstood. Well, anyway, I didn't understand it then, but charismatics are inexcusable to limit this benefit to others. How do they do it? Why, well, just go anywhere, almost anywhere. And they'll call you a fanatic. Many will say you're deceived. If you believe that you can take literally the Word of God, like James 5, for example, or many of the other promises of healing, even this one, He heals all your diseases, take that literally. They say no. God heals if it's His will. Charismatics teach this. God heals through medical science. We've got the leading healing evangelist now with a new book, Building a Medical Center. And in it, he gives you the steps for healing. The first step is call the doctor. The second step is call God. We're just seeing people everywhere limiting and thereby robbing charismatics of their benefits. Oh, you should pray if it be God's will. No, it's not always God's will to heal his children. And they'll cite you a case that someone got anointed and died on their hands to prove that, you know, whatever it is they're trying to prove, if it be God's will, or he heals through medicines. Well, my suggestion is you don't let man, whether he's charismatic or non-charismatic, rob you of your benefits. God says, just as I forgive all your iniquities and not some of them, I heal all your diseases. You can't have it both ways. And I taught this psalm in seminary, not like I'm teaching now by no means, but I was, I guess, fairly good at teaching the letter because I had a lot of students looking for my courses. I just say that to make a point because I tried to stay with the Word even without the Spirit. And that's a little unusual today. When I got to that verse in the Hebrew, I didn't know what to do with it, like any more than I did with Isaiah in the Hebrew, because it says he forgives all your iniquities and he heals all your diseases. And all you can do with it is believe it or say that's the resurrection, which is what we said. Well, you'll get them all healed in the resurrection. <laughs> well, why didn't God say that? Somewhere, anywhere in his word. Why send Jesus to the cross to heal us in the resurrection? The resurrection itself is something that won't need healing, a new body. Well, we don't have to labor that point. The third benefit is verse 4a, redemption. We're redeemed from death. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. The word in Hebrew is shakat, which means destruction. And the phrase here, he redeems your life from the pit or destruction, refers to redemption from temporal blessing and adversity. It's not talking about the destruction of hell, although certainly you're redeemed from that destruction of the final day the wicked will have to experience, but he refers here to the redemption from temporal danger and adversity. Now, Psalm 91 ought to be read with Psalm 103, verse 4, because just to say he's redeemed us from destruction doesn't tell some people, most people, very much. We won't read it all, but here's what he redeems you from, and it's all from destruction. He's a fortress and a refuge for those who put their trust in him. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler, that's the devil, from the noisome pestilence, whatever the pestilence is. People die of, what's this new one now? Legionnaire's disease. They've never heard of demons. They don't know what's killing them. They can't isolate it. And just people are mysteriously dropping like flies. And it's estimated several thousand will die this year of Legionnaire's disease. 
He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings you shall trust. His truth will be your shield and buckler. You'll not be afraid for the terror by night. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a lot of it around. My, there's a lot of terror. San Francisco, Chicago, New York, North Webster, <laughs> Warsaw. That's right. It's everywhere. The terror by night. You'll not be afraid of that. Are for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Bombs, whatever. A thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but none of this will come nigh you. Praise God. And on and on. You ought to read Psalm 91 if you want to know what destruction we are delivered from. So, with Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5, I recite every morning, that is, I claim it in faith, Psalm 91, these benefits, all of them. I enumerate several and then say, you know, and I just claim all the benefits and promises and blessings of Psalm 91 in Jesus' name. Then I have a third stage, and I start covering myself, my wife, my children, all my sons-in-laws and grandchildren, the whole body, expectant mothers, new mothers, babies, the work of the church, the workers on the church building, that is, all of our property and possessions the Lord has given us with the blood of Jesus. Amen. It takes a little while to get out of bed, but it's worth it. Amen. The old slew foot has, you know, been at work with expectant mothers and new mothers and babies. So for a long time, I, before I go to sleep and when I wake up, the Lord reminds me of them. And I think we should not forget them because we're not in the birthing business here, but if they died in the hospital, you'd never hear, well, here's the latest news. Dr. So-and-so lost another patient. You'll never hear that. Well, here's the Goshen Hospital again. We had two died last week. You never hear that. But when Faith Assembly or Glory Barn sneezes, <laughs> channel 13, 27, 42, 64, whatever they are. <laughs> Praise God. Well, so I don't take it lightly. We don't have a position here on natural childbirth. That's their choice to trust the Lord. But praise God, the devil will, you know, try to interfere any way he can. Redemption from all these things, Psalm 91. All right, and then a fourth benefit he doesn't want you to forget is coronation. He crowns us. Oh, he'll crown you to the extent of your faith with loving kindness and tender mercies. That is compassion. Loving kindness and compassion. These things are abundantly added to all the other benefits. Like a crown. He crowns all of them with these things. His loving kindness. His hesed in Hebrew, for those of you studying Hebrew. His loving kindness and his tender mercies, his compassions, they fail not. Psalm 8, remember we studied it and I entitled that the crown of creation, man, the crown of God's creation. Who is man that thou art mindful of him, David asks. He says, you've crowned him with glory and honor. You've given him dominion and authority over all things, heaven, earth, and seas. So God crowns the David's who believe for it. You see, God does not just limit his blessings to us to our essential needs. That's the message of this church. And we don't mean just material things, but he blesses you with all of those spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But God doesn't limit himself to blessing us merely with respect to essential needs, but he crowns us with abundance. David in Psalm 23, 6 said, My cup, it's full. No, he didn't. 
He said, My cup is running over with blessing. Hallelujah. Oh, do you know what it is to have your cup running over? I've experienced this to a good extent. But I expect to get a bigger cup so it'll run over more. <laughs> now, I've never seen a child of God, a Christian, starving death. Anyone ever seen a Christian starve to death? No, you haven't, because the Bible, Psalm 37, 25, says you won't. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And if anyone claims to be a child of God that says, I'm forsaken and I have to beg, he better back up to find out if he's a child of God, if he's righteous. But you see, that's just your bread, essential needs. Psalm 37, 25 gives you that, but if you back up to verse 4, you get the abundance, the crown. He says, delight yourself in me, and I will give you the desires of your heart. Hallelujah. Desires of your heart. Why be afraid of receiving or asking for or claiming the desires? People, they just have the hardest time explaining that. I bought two radios recently, $1,600. I tried them two days, didn't like them. Took them back, I want my old one back. Like it much better. <laughs> he couldn't understand that, but you'll lose money. I said, look, I'm a Christian. I'd already told him that. <laughs> I said, the Lord tells me in the Word of God that I can have the desires of my heart. I said, I don't desire those two radios you sold me. I desire the one I had. It's much better. <laughs> well, he didn't have it. He had a new one just like it, which suited me better since I'd used mine maybe about a year. And I said, I drive the best car. I said, you know, not proving anything, but I travel a lot and you can get there in comfort. Yes. You can get there walking a pogo stick, bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord says he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now I said one time, I bought an Oldsmobile, which is a come down from what I'm driving. As far as some people are concerned, because I had one brother say, Oh, you've come down. I said, No, not at all. The Lord said he would give me the desires of my heart. And I saw the Oldsmobile. I liked it better than the Cadillac, the looks of it. So I said, I trade cars every year anyway. I wanted it. Desire. You couldn't have affections for Cadillacs and Lincolns if you'll take an Oldsmobile. I said, yeah, I'm thinking about getting a Chevy station wagon next year. <coughs> because it'll meet my needs better. You know, to haul our books to meetings and PA equipment and all of that, because Cadillac doesn't make a station wagon. <laughs> Except the kind you lie down in to get there. <laughs> I didn't want one of those. <laughs> Wrong testimony. That's the one with the little light and the siren on it, in case you're not keeping up. And I gave him that example. I said, I drove an Oldsmobile for a year when I can drive the best because I claim the best. God gives them to me, you know, paid for. Well, I said, I desire the radio that costs less money than the one that I bought from you. Well, you lose so many. I said, I don't care. Praise God. I said, I want the desire of my heart on that. Well, we're getting through to him because I left him a stack of our books. <laughs> He's a Christian, too, confesses it, and he said of me, because I just walk in there, I see something, and I say, I desire that. <laughs> I don't even ask prices, generally, you know, and I bought a lot from him. And he said, you know, talking along this line, he said, I told my wife one day when you walked out, you'd told me you were a Christian minister, and he said he told his wife when I walked out, said, there is a man that must be pleasing the Lord, because I've never seen anyone that just comes in and buys what he wants, who's a minister. You know, they're usually as poor as church mice. Church mice. <laughs> then we got to talking the next time he told me this. And I told him about the abundant life and that there's no contradiction between the deeper life book and the faith book, that you can't live the deeper life, crucified life, if you're always worrying about your finances. And quoted some of those promises where God promises to supply abundantly. If you forsake it all, he'll give it back a hundredfold. I said, it's all in the Word. He said, I believe that. He said, I really believe that. He said, I tried to tell our pastor that 
when he preached a sermon on material poverty to prove you were spiritual. And after the service, we were talking about it. The pastor, in view of what he asked him, he said, well, would you rather have your blessings in this life or the next? Well, he said, I asked him, why couldn't you have them in both places? <laughs> it never occurs to Christians that God loves them, that he said, you see, so many of these promises are for here, temporal blessing. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and I'll supply all your needs, material needs, the things the Gentiles seek after, he said in Matthew 6. He said, I asked him, why couldn't you be blessed in both lives? And he said, you're the first minister I have ever heard that believes like I do. He says, I believe God's going to bless this business. And he is. He's blessing his business. He really is. So he's a candidate for charismatic truth, I believe. I gave him about all I could haul in, and <laughs> he hasn't said anything about the literature, but we'll give the Lord time to do his work. Now, I've never seen a Christian starving, you never will, for I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread, but are you going to stop with that when God has placed the abundance here? Hey, did you forget what he said in Psalm 103? He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And then, verse 5, he satisfies your mouth with good things. Now we come to satisfaction, verse 5. Because that's in line with what we're talking about. Really, it all goes together. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He satisfies your mouth with good things. Now, literally, you're going to like this. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and remember Jews, Hebrew scholars, translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, so we have to give them the benefit of the doubt, most of the time at least, that they knew what words, Greek words, to choose to translate the Hebrew word. And the Greek word they chose to translate, he satisfies your mouth with good things. The Hebrew doesn't say mouth. He satisfies your desire with good things. Wow. How about that? That's what we're talking about. Delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Mark eleven twenty four. What things soever you desire when you pray, believe you have received, you'll have them. Psalm 37, 4. Mark eleven twenty four. Philippians 4, 19. My God will supply your essential needs. Paul said, my God will supply, not your essential needs, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. <laughs> well, so satisfaction. He crowns you, adorns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, and he satisfies your desire with good things. Well, BDB, for those of you who have the big Hebrew lexicon and have taken or will take Hebrew, you'll find it doesn't translate as mouth either. The word, they suggest it means adornment, clothing, ornaments. And they translate it as satisfies your attire with good things. That is, he adorns you outwardly with good things, as well as those inward blessings. We well, see the word of God said that. Either way you go, it's a blessing. But I'm not going to follow BDB when I've got a Jew's word to take for it back in the second century B.C. They translated desire. I'm going to leave it there. He satisfies my desire with good things. If you want to make it, he satisfies your adornment with good things, and that's all right, too. But that's a little too limited, just outward adornment. Satisfaction, then, fifthly, rejuvenation. Verse 5b, he satisfies your desires with good, good things. Now, if you have King James, it says, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Hebrew doesn't say that. Notice that's in italics. It's like you get all these other things so that you'll be rejuvenated. No, that's just one of the blessings. He satisfies your desire with good things. Your youth is renewed like the eagles. It's God who renews your youth like an eagle's. 
So that doesn't apply there. Why an eagle? Why not a sparrow? The figure of the eagle is given obviously because the eagle molts, M-O-U-L-T-S, molts every so often. I don't know whether it's every year or whatever, but sheds its feathers and I think it's claws and skin like on the feet and beak maybe, the outward part of the beak. But anyway, the old eagle becomes a new eagle. He didn't say he renews your youth like the sparrows because sparrows are always falling to the ground in the Bible. <laughs> you know, not a sparrow falls to the ground, not a sparrow's sold, you know, for food. They ate sparrows and so forth. So the eagle is chosen because it's a symbol of perpetual youth. Other birds molt, but they're not like the eagle. The eagle is selected because of its strength, its vigor, its dignity. The Greeks had a proverb. The eagle's old age is as good as the sparrow's youth. <laughs> Actually, the lark's youth, but maybe you didn't know what a lark was. <laughs> the eagle's old age is as good as the lark's youth. Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. It's kind of encouraging along this line, Isaiah 40. Remember, when you're born, you begin to die. When you're born, you begin to get old. So it's not just those who are over the hill, as some people say, that he's talking to in these passages. But certainly he's addressing himself to those who may think, you know, that it's time to give up, cash in, buy a rocking chair. <laughs> Make sure your insurance paid up. Verse 30, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I claim it all. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. I really get enthusiastic about passages like that. I'll tell you, because I spent most of my life dying. I was born in the world sick, had double pneumonia as a baby. The devil tried. He knew what ministry the Lord was going to give me. And it was a miracle I lived through double pneumonia as a six-month-old child. I've had everything. Had to be rescued from drowning, run over by a big heavy truck, and heart attack, kidney operation, which is I guess the second worst thing after heart surgery. And I've been operated on, oh, five times. I've got a little bit of a judge of what's worse. <laughs> That's worse than the bad to begin with. And so <laughs> everything that came along, I took it. Of course, I confessed it too, but <laughs> I really get enthused about these passages that say that he will renew your youth. We're not talking about, you know, well, you just claim your healing on and on, you'll never die. That isn't what the Bible teaches, perpetual physical immortality. But that isn't to rule out that some of us can get younger and younger waiting on the Lord to appear to translate us. You get what you confess. I think we've got a sermon on that on the book of Hebrews, around chapter 2, I believe, that I wouldn't recommend you listen to it if you just got saved or the baptism. Not that it would hurt you, but I just don't think <laughs> that you're ready for strong meat. But when you're ready for strong meat, you'll find the Bible does say very clearly in more than one place, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15 are just two of the places. There will be a group of people alive when Jesus comes. They'll not die. They'll be changed in a moment. And if you know the Bible and can read the signs of the times, like the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, then it's not extremism to claim if you have the faith for it, you believe you'll see Jesus come. That is... You won't be called out of the grave. You'll just be called into transformation. Amen. But no one can have that faith for you. There's a whole tape on it, so don't knock it till you hear it. 
because it's out of the Word of God. I'll just leave you. You won't even have to listen to the tape. I'll leave you with 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. If you can't find that fact in there, well, you'd never find it on a tape. Rejuvenation. I like the figure here of the eagle. Well, are we to take Isaiah 40 and Psalm 103, verse 5, literally? I'll ask you a question before you answer it. Do you take the rest of the benefits literally? How about the rest of them? Healing of all your diseases? Well, how about even forgiving all your iniquities? If you only give some, well, you've got a problem. If you take the others literally, then why back off of verse 5? I get some smiles and laughs as we travel about the country when I, somehow or other, that comes out in a message. People really get a kick out of me saying, you know, that I claim verse 5, and if they would care to give me $10 because I wouldn't show it for less than $10, my old passport picture, I could prove my point. I mean, it ought to be worth a steak dinner for me to have to suffer the embarrassment of showing you that picture. My wife pulled it out to someone here lately, not too long ago, and they said, you really do look like you're dead there. <laughs> and I really do. I really do. It's the only corpse you'll ever see with its eyes open. Oh, it's pathetic. So it really doesn't matter, I tell people, what I look like now to you. If you'd see the before, you'd say there is a big difference. He's a lot younger looking than he was 12 years ago. Now, I'm not going see just by looks. That isn't what I'm saying. I'm talking about, well, I think I said it Sunday night. I'm 57, but it never occurs to me that I'm not 27. It just doesn't occur to me. I can't even imagine how it would feel like to be 57. <laughs> I really have a struggle thinking of myself as a grandfather. I really do. Spiritually speaking, it's hard to say the words. It's no put-down of grandchildren or the office of being grandfathers and mothers and grandparents. I'm just saying that I'm not making this up or it's not a put-on. When I repeatedly tell you verse 5 is meaningful to me, I really believe it. I don't know what it feels like to be 57. I know what it felt like to be like, when did I start really having the sickness troubles? Of course, I had all that through my youth, but I thought everybody, you know, was always ready to die and halfway doing it. But I really started getting bad off in my 30s physically. So I'm talking about not just what a person looks like, but how are they really inside? I don't know what Moses looked like. He may have had some wrinkles, but his eye was not dim. Neither his natural strength abated at 120. And I don't care where people claim Moses' experience. There's no promise for Moses' experience, but there's a promise for you. Psalm 91, verse 16, with long life will I satisfy him. Is it to be taken literally? Then don't take anything literally if you're afraid of those passages. They must mean what they say. God will fulfill every promise he makes to you, and that is he will restore your youth. Even if you're 16, you need it. Amen. Oh, you ought to hear the reports, medical reports of 20-year-old youths today. Oh, it's sad in this country. It's terrible. Their health is ruined already. Most of them, not some of them. You can't live on a diet of what they live on, mentally and physically, and not be worn out. So, yes, you should be claiming it however old you are. You say, I don't understand it fully. You don't have to understand everything God promises. Just claim all He promises. I don't understand all He promises. I just claim all He promises. I don't know all the implications of this, but I know he means what he said. We can mount up as youths, run like a deer, walk and not grow weary. Very few people can walk and not grow weary today because we're in the age of the mechanical walker, four wheels on it. <laughs> That's right. When I was a youth, really a youth back in my teens and before that, we thought nothing of walking five miles to go swimming. Nothing of it. And you had to get back. 
<laughs> Ride 25 miles on a bike, and that's when they were the big old balloon tires, and you worked. Three speeds, 10 speeds, one speed, and it was slow. <laughs> ride 25 miles, and you had to get back. <laughs> you can't do that anymore, so I believe these promises are to be taken literally. Well, certainly I believe them. Moses, 120, Caleb, when he was 85, he said, I'm as strong as I was when I was 40. Now, that's after the fall. He was a sinner. He needed redemption. He was not Adam before the fall, but he was as strong as Moses. And many in the Bible the same way, patriarchs. God doesn't promise anything he won't fulfill. Don't do like the church and the world does at 35. You listen. Maybe you've said it yourself. You're over the hill. 35, you're over the hill. That means you, when you're 35, you probably won't make it to 70, and so that means you're over the hill. It's all downhill. And they hope they'll make it to 65 so they can collect some of that insurance have been paying in, Social Security, old age, health benefits.